B-SPAN, America's communication network for veterans. The Veteran Special Program's American National Network, B-SPAN Spotlight. Our spotlight today shines on Sergeant Allen, who served in the 216th Engineer Battalion Combat Heavy, 1st Infantry Division in Operation Iraqi Freedom II. Sergeant Allen is an author, a decorated soldier, and our guest, and a girl. Sergeant Sharon D. Allen. Now, how does a young girl from Ohio decide to join the Army? I was actually 22, so I wasn't that young to join the military, so I definitely uh, could not claim, you know, youthful, whatever. Uh, I joined for several reasons. Some of them were good reasons. Like, uh, I did believe that it was my generation's turn to serve because the Vietnam veterans took care of us for so long. My grandfather was a prisoner of war, so, you know, continuing in that tradition. But also, I was a very small child, believe it or not, and very sickly. And so I kind of look forward to the physical challenges and the mental challenges, and I'm just easily motivated. Now, you had to know at the time that you walked into the recruiting station that there are probably more guys in the Army than girls. Yeah, and, and the job I picked, too, because there are certain jobs in the military where, you know, there's a lot of females, but I was a um, fuel truck driver was my primary, so I drove a big moving bomb that says flammable on the side, and then eventually I was a heavy equipment operator, so there were not a lot of uh, women in my company. There were only two women in my entire platoon. Now, how did you, how did you get into this, this supply because I actually, I scored very high on the ASFAB, and I found out later that I could have picked any job open to women, but I didn't really do my due diligence, and my recruiter says, oh, you qualify for fuel. So I said, okay. <laughs> and I signed and shipped. And you shipped to Little Korea. I shipped to Iraq eventually. Yeah, but wasn't it uh, Little Korea? That's what we used to call Fort Leonard Oh, Leonard Wood? Wood? Yeah. We didn't call Little Korea anymore. So yeah. We did because of the weather. The yeah, weather was, was so much indicative of Korea at that time. I was there June, July, and August, so I was kind of stupid about when I joined as well. All right, now your first day, you get to uh, Fort Leonard Wood. You are at the uh, station, and you're probably given your, uh, your TA-50, your, uh, your clothing allowance. You had to be thinking, did I make the right decision? Actually, I was the first person to get in trouble in the entire basic training because we weren't allowed to smile, and I kept smiling because I was 22. So I was a little bit older than you know these 17, 18 year olds who'd never been away from home. So when the drill sergeants got on the buses and they said, you know, welcome to our world, welcome to hell, it sounded like WWE wrestling to me, <laughs> and I kind of smiled. So I got in trouble the first day. Oh, 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 oh! No haircut. You didn't get the number one. I got a haircut, but it wasn't the number it wasn't one. The number they gave one. me like this bang thing. It was very bad. All righty. So you you sign in. You're in Fort Leonard Wood. And uh, how many females were there along with you? Um, well, about 15% of the military is female, so about that in, in basic training. They're about 15%, I'd say. Nobody felt uncomfortable? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you go through basic training, and uh, uh, there's probably this misnomer that might be uh, sexist in nature that uh, uh, the girls have got to compete with the boys. Uh, that's probably not what happened, but how did that come about? How did the uh, how did that evolution of male and female work? Because you guys had to get used to each other. Well, actually, I mean, our drill sergeants were both male and female, and the female drill sergeants were ten times worse than the male drill sergeants. So it wasn't like anybody looked at them and thought that they were weak in any way. I think in the military, it's it's more egalitarian because even as a civilian, if you if you're willing to prove yourself doing a man's job, because right now I'm a mechanic. They'll let you prove yourselves, but um, in the military, you, can, you prove yourself every day. Every day, they're making you do something that's beyond anything you've ever done before, and everybody can see you do it. So, like, uh, eventually, I was the only expert uh, machine gunner for the battalion. I didn't have to say women can shoot. I just proved it. When you were in uh, uh, Fort Leonard Wood, you had to go through basic training. You had to go through uh, uh, AIT and so forth. Did you find any uh, situations where it appeared as though the men around you felt the need to protect you. No, I never did. 
I felt the need to protect the men as much as they did me. You know, I would protect uh, any man or woman next to me, and I think that they felt the same way when you go through the same training. Have you traveled a lot uh, outside the country or uh, outside, of, outside of Illinois? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess when you're in the, uh, the military, you're put into situations where you are meeting people from different cultures, different, uh, uh, different everything. And to assimilate yourself with all of these different people, how did you find it? Was it exciting or was it interesting? Yeah, the, the military is an interesting demographic because it, it's pretty much a cross-section of society, except for um, independently wealthy. You have everybody in the military, so you have to pretty much uh, figure out how to get along really quickly. But when I was stationed in America, it wasn't as big a deal as when I went to Iraq the first time because my platoon was from uh, Portsmouth, Ohio, which is uh, very near to West Virginia. So there was more of a culture shock between me and my platoon than there was between the Iraqis and me. <laughs> <laughs> and when you, uh, when you knew where you were going to be deployed, uh, how did your family react to that? Oh, not very well. They didn't react very well when I joined the military because <laughs> I didn't ask permission. I just did it. So, I mean, I, I'm, I think it's probably more difficult for the families at home to have uh, somebody go to Iraq than it, than it is to go to Iraq yourself. All righty. Sharon D. Allen is our guest on V-SPAN Spotlight. And when we return, you're going to hear how Sharon became very creative in saving her life. But instead of receiving a medal, she got into trouble. This is V-SPAN. I'm State Senator Kirk Dillard from the western suburbs of Chicago. These are tough economic times for all professions. But there is one way to find good, wholesome employment in a difficult economy if you're interested in broadcasting and communications. The Illinois Center for Broadcasting has an excellent track record for the placement of their graduates. I see them all the time at the various radio stations, television stations, and places that I visit. And in these difficult times when you're looking for a job, you want to have a good education, and the Illinois Center for Broadcasting is a great place to start. V-SPAN, the Veterans Communications Network. This is V-SPAN. Our V-SPAN spotlight is on Sergeant Sharon D. Allen. Uh, Sharon, you did something very creative when you were in Iraq that uh, probably should have given you a medal for doing, but instead you got into a little trouble. Well, my primary job in the military was petroleum supply, which meant that I drove a Hemet fuel truck. We didn't actually, I didn't do that job when we were in the States because there's BP on the corner, so I worked as a mechanic. So I never actually saw my Hemet fueler until I got to Iraq. So I'd been in Iraq approximately four hours when they walk me up to my motor pool and I get the first glimpse of this glorious stallion of a truck and it says flammable on the side and it has the big red placard with the flames on it just in case they couldn't read. So the first thing I did was rip that placard off there and spray paint milk on the side. And uh, so they tried to, well one uh, E7 tried to uh, bring me up on charges of uh, destruction of government property but my first sergeant said that I had the shortest life expectancy for anybody in the battalion and I could do whatever I needed to do. So there's something about military intelligence being an oxymoron? Uh, a little bit, uh. yeah, because we didn't even have up armor. This was 2004, so I drove an unarmored fuel truck that said, is a camouflage truck, <laughs> but it says flammable <laughs> on the side, an 80 million point type. You just got to wonder. Mm -hmm. You just got to wonder. All right, so now you get to Iraq. And uh, I'm thinking, never having been there, that the Iraqis have a different viewpoint of women than we do. And how would a female soldier be received in Iraq? Well, the, it depends on where we were, because I was stationed in Tikrit, but we were all over the place. And at one point, I was up in Kurdistan. And up in Kurdistan, the women are college educated, drive cars, wear pants. So it's very different and than rural Iraq, like um, around uh, Samara, you know, there. Uh, they, they don't treat, well, I don't know how they treat women. I never actually saw them how they treat women. But I did have uh, one Arab man tell me, in Iraq, women don't walk in front of men. And I said, in Iraq, women don't carry M16s. <laughs> so 
<laughs> he kept walking. But for the most part, we tried not to do that to them. We tried not to emasculate them in any way because we were trying to get along with them. We were, uh, on, on work sites, uh, you know, when I was operating my bulldozer, it was easier for me if the Iraqis on the work crew would work with me than, than work against me. And for the most part, I was kind of a novelty. And especially in Kurdistan, they'd bring the guys out and they'd just watch me on my dozer. And they loved it because, and, and some of them also said they realized that I was not a Muslim and I was not an Iraqi, so I, they didn't expect me to conform to their rules and their religion. But I was just like a spectacle, you know. You got to come see this girl on a bulldozer. Everybody come up to you and have their picture taken with you? Oh, yes. I had my picture <laughs> taken about 5,000 times in Iraq. <laughs> now, in uh, basic training in AIT, I'm going to assume that uh, uh, males and females were segregated for sleeping quarters. Just sleeping. We slept on different floors in the same building. I was actually the, uh, like the platoon guide, so I, it was my job to make sure that all the guys had water in their canteens and had everything they needed. And I couldn't, make, I couldn't check because I didn't live on the same floor. But... Um, Right, you know, after we got up for morning formation, we were together the rest of the day at all times. And uh, at one point, I realized that I was really being stupid because the military will let you slide if you start sliding from day one. But once you um, achieve something, they will not let you back up. And so they had one of the pits, you know, with the um, wood chips, and they were making us uh, POW crawl through the wood chips. And I noticed, it took me way too long to figure this out, but most people only made it halfway and then they blow a whistle and had to run back. I always made it to the end. Well, the guys who only made it halfway only had half as far to run back. So after like four days of this, I'm like, okay, this is dumb. I'm just never gonna make it to the end. But that last time when I decided this is the last time I make it to the end, this guy, Private, his last name is Halfpot, Private Halfpot, whispers to me, Alan, you notice you're the only girl that ever makes it. I was like, oh man. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to maintain because they noticed that I wasn't, I wasn't <laughs> you were not the average yeah. little girl on the block. All right, now you get to Iraq. I'm going to assume also that there is probably uh, uh, different sleeping arrangements there than you experienced when you were in uh, training. Actually, uh, most soldiers, I believe, they are segregated like um, into Crete and the major fobs, but we were very much out in the middle of nowhere. So the choice was either I sleep in the tent with the guys or I sleep outside the tent with the guys, which is kind of stupid and a lot more dangerous. So I slept right next to the guys. Uh, usually, it was kind of funny, this guy, uh, Specialist Wiley, he, his rack was right next to mine almost all the time because we moved, I went to 28 FOBs, so we'd only be there a week or two at a time. And, uh, this, and we didn't have clean clothes, we didn't have laundry, we didn't have running water or electricity uh, most of the time. So, you know, we were in varying degrees of nastiness, and I grabbed this brown t-shirt that was half on my rack and half on his rack. and. And I, I said, Wiley, is this mine or yours? And he smelled it, and he said, it's yours. I was like, oh, that's so <laughs> disgusting, because I'm telling you what, I wasn't, it wasn't my shampoo he was smelling. <laughs> and uh, we're going to be taking a look at a uh, photograph that, uh, that we have of the living quarters in eh, maybe about four or five minutes. And uh, just to let us know, what are we going to be seeing when we see this photograph? That was actually um, Saddam's son Uday. It was like his little love palace or whatever. Uh, they dropped us. We were two miles from Samara uh, to prepare a base for the invasion of Samara. And when they dropped us there, they didn't realize that there was actually a building. So we just got lucky. It only had three walls, but it had three walls. <laughs> so it was kind of nice. We had to shovel the floor of all the glass and everything. but. At least it provided some some um, protection from the the dirt, but so the picture is of the other girl who was in my platoon, uh, Specialist Predmore, and how we tried to make it as livable as possible by cleaning it up and you know making it look like a barracks, but it was definitely a bombed out building. <laughs> and when we return, we're going to hear why Sergeant Sharon D. Allen felt safer in Iraq than she did in Ohio. This is V-SPAN. ICB works because it gives you the hands-on training you will need to take advantage of real-life opportunities. While I was a student here, I learned everything from radio production in the radio studios to video production and editing and use those skills in my job now. I had an internship for one week with the PGA Tour Network on Sirius XM Radio and because of the things that I learned here, I was able to parlay that internship into a full-time job covering the PGA Tour. We produce live play-by-play -play from every PGA Tour event, and this job has taken me, taken me all over the country and to several others. 
Without the skills I learned here at the Illinois Center for Broadcasting, I would have never made it as far as I have. You love watching and talking about sports, so why not turn that passion into a career in sports broadcasting at the Illinois Center for Broadcasting? Hi, I'm Matt Abaticola from Sports Radio 670, The Score, Chicago's number one sports talk station. I'm a graduate of the Illinois Center for Broadcasting, graduated in 2001, and I wouldn't be where I'm at today without the time that I spent at the Illinois Center for Broadcasting. With a 10-month program and financial aid available, you'll learn to be on the air and behind the scenes. The great aspect of it is that you're working on equipment that's being used in the marketplace today. It's not outdated material, it's not outdated equipment, they're not teaching you old techniques. You're learning actual techniques and working on equipment that are being used in marketplaces today all over the country. For more information, go to beonair.com forward slash Chicago Sports or text Chicago Sports to 33239 or call 630-916-1700. The Illinois Center for Broadcasting, where sports broadcasting careers begin. B-SPAN, the American Veterans Communications Network. This is V-SPAN. Our V-SPAN spotlight is on Sergeant Sharon D. Allen. She's an author, a columnist, a guest speaker, and you had mentioned, uh, Sharon, that you felt safer in Iraq than you did in Ohio. Well, in Iraq, um, you know, my biggest fear in Iraq was not, it wasn't dying, it was dying alone. And you can't die alone in Iraq because you're never alone in Iraq. Uh, you know, when I was in the tents, there were at least 12 to 100 other guys, generally guys, in there. And so I could get killed, but I couldn't get kidnapped. And when I came home to Ohio, I was single, I lived alone, and suddenly it was kind of terrifying to be alone. Because in, in Iraq, you're not even alone when you, when you take a shower. And uh, that one picture uh, of our living conditions in FOB 7, we didn't have any running water and we didn't have electricity, but we did have a water truck. And the thing is in the military that if you're a mechanic and you deadline a vehicle, it's deadline. Nobody can say that that vehicle can be used. So even a four-star general. So somebody slashed the tire of that water truck and we had showers. We cranked open that valve and we were taking showers. But we also got mortared every night at 5-7. And so we'd have to plan, kind of guess when we were going to get attacked because I just didn't want to die naked. <laughs> Let's take a look at that picture. Uh, this is a photograph of your living quarters in Iraq and one it, of them yeah it, it varied okay now this one just looks so neat it looks so orderly well you, you kind of um, it was a chaotic place and so you try to impose as much order as you can you know I think that's I put up pictures at every fob even if it wasn't a fob if I slept outside of my truck I had pictures taped to the side of my truck when I went to sleep at night okay and, and what is a fob oh I'm sorry forward operating base. ah okay there you so go all, forward all operating base we went from um, some places we lived in tents, some places we lived in buildings, some places we lived in an old um, Iraqi Air Force base that was all bombed out too, but it, was, it had buildings, we had electroshock showers, and uh, some places we had shower trailers, some places we didn't have anything. We were engineers, so we got whatever was there when we got there. Now, how did you withstand the uh, mortar attacks? Well, most of the time they couldn't aim very well. I was very lucky to have been there in 2004 because they, the Iraqis were not very good shots at this point. And so uh, on a mortar attack, though, they usually walk it in. And uh, very rarely did they manage to walk it in. If they did manage to walk it in and get, you know, get closer to you, then you knew that they, they did have their aim right. And then you just, there's nothing you can do because it's like a cannonball. If you run, you might run right toward it. All of these experiences uh, in a combat situation are uh, uh, events that most people can't relate to. And when you hear about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, most people who have not been in the military don't even know what that is. Uh, you've been very close to it. Yes, when I, when I first came home, um, like I said, I was kind of terrified to be by myself at night in Ohio. But um, I had three things happen to me when I came home. Uh, the strangest one was I would have false flashbacks, but only in that, um, that phase between when you're awake and when you're asleep. So I'd be going to sleep and then I'd see something and I'd actually feel it. Like I saw somebody throw a grenade and I felt like I got blown up, but that didn't actually happen to me in Iraq, so it was a false flashback. 
But I also found out that it only happened when I was completely sober. So I just thought if I never <laughs> went to bed completely sober, I'd be fine. <laughs> that, however, had its own disadvantages. So I ended up, I did go to the, uh, the Army provides free counseling sessions. I went to one because I just want to know physiologically why it was happening to me and wrap my head around it. And I did. And I also, I mean, I speak about it, I write about it, and I think that, that that's helped me quite a bit because some of the guys in my platoon, they are still not doing very well, and it's seven years later. There was a study that uh, came out that said that, I think it was this year, uh, on average, there is one suicide per day uh, related to uh, the trauma of war. And one of the things that you suggested was that writing can be a tremendous outlet. Absolutely. I had a standing column in some newspapers in Ohio while I was there. Since then, I've, I've written about it extensively. And it, it really serves more than one purpose because one thing for me was I didn't want to forget anything that happened out there, especially if somebody died because I felt like it would be a disservice to that person. But once I wrote it down, I didn't have to think about it anymore because I recorded it and I could always go back to it. Uh, another thing was it's kind of catharsis, which is that's related. But also I wanted civilians to know what it was like out there and they're allowed to laugh at it too because that's how we got through it and I don't want them to look at veterans and think that it's a, it's a solemn thing and when they see me and they say oh you're in Iraq what about you don't have to get quiet and, and I'm not a very serious person and I'll answer any questions you got. And the writing uh, took place in, in your life as a book. Yes. Talk about your book. I wrote a book called 100 Things I Learned in Iraq, Lesson 55, Try Not to Be Outside When a Chinook Lands. I've since changed it to helicopter because people think that a Chinook is a bird, and it is not. It is a helicopter. <laughs> and here is a photograph of what it looks like when a Chinook Lands. is landing. And you get sandblasted, and there is nowhere to hide. This is an incredible photograph. Just take that in for a moment and think of what it would be like to be there. It was like a cheese grater. And you were. And I was the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Experiences you'll not soon forget. Where can we get more information about Sharon D. Allen? Uh, my website is actually www.sharondallen.com. So and you're using the D because there are a lot of Sharon Allens? There's a CEO and she keeps stealing all my website results. <laughs> She's like really in the top 50 or something. Sharon, where can we get your book? Uh, my book has not yet been published, but I am in two anthologies. One is called Operation Homecoming, writing um, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the home front in the words of the U.S. troops and their families. And the other one is Powder, writing from women in the ranks from Vietnam to Iraq. All righty. One last question I have to ask. Did men look at you as a sex object? I certainly hope so. <laughs> Sergeant Sharon D. Allen. Thank you for being with us, Sergeant Allen. It was just wonderful to have you here, and thank you for being with us on V-SPAN Spotlight. This program was produced by the broadcast professionals at the Illinois Center for Broadcasting. Check it out at beonair.com. And for more information on the Veterans Programs American National Network, go to vspan.org. I'm Rich Rennick. Thanks for making us a part of your day. Serving the American veterans community with news, information, and entertainment, this is V-SPAN. V-SPAN is a network designed to serve the American veteran. Its mission is to inform, inspire, enlighten, honor, remember, and entertain. Soldiers and veterans will not ask for our help, but it needs to be given nevertheless. Winston Churchill once said, Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. This sentiment stands true today. Veterans deserve this. We, we owe them, not the other way around. It's time to pay back our debt to our soldiers and our veterans. It's time for V-SPAN.